I want to make some remarks here. Um, uh, one or two lectures ago, I asked for people's background um, with respect to a set of common needs. Many of these related to multi-tier applications, related to use of Git, related to um, questions involving use of databases, uh, concurrency, et cetera. And um, uh, my dialogue with you at that time alerted me to the fact that there's there's some real unmet needs uh, out there. Um, and it, And it's not unmet needs for some, you know, uh, obscure corner of this course. It's it's unmet needs that are central for going on into the software industry, becoming a strong programmer, much less a virtuoso software developer. Um, there's a, a certain body of understanding that you need. And um, while you could go forth, get hired and get that experience in the job, you can be much better equipped if you understand these things while in school. And I shared with you that this, this class is a different class than those on which it depends. It's very unlike 270. It's very unlike 370. In many ways, it's unlike 353. It, it's a course which is really designed to bring you closer to professional level understanding of best practices, processes, principles associated with software development in a contemporary context. And it's more than that, it's, it's designed to really take you from this world where you're implementing small scale systems, getting them working and declaring it done to really engaging seriously with the issues that distinguish particular types of project challenges. The projects you take on here, whether it's the beep engine or the, the issues with projectile point management or the Oculus system or the veterinary alerting system, um, these are real world needs and delivering on them um, effectively, delivering on them with quality, delivering on them with um, with future proofing in mind is 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 really hard. It's 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 a big difference between pro forma delivering on something by name and declaring it done, and really analyzing what are the what are the bottlenecks here? What are the real needs? What are the things that are going to bite us? What are the the issues that are going to be a pain? for us to effectively test this application or will inhibit its ability to evolve? What are some issues that will prevent it from working at scale? What are some issues that will prevent us from visualizing large data sets in the objects? What are some issues that will prevent us, the, the BEAP engine, from effectively handling multiple concurrent user requests? What are some issues with the projectile point database that could get in the way of, of sound operation when you have several users you, you, uh, looking at it independently? And the, the goal of this course is to really get you to think about the real issues, not just implementing it sort of in name, not just ticking off check boxes as to the functionality, but, but asking how do we build this thing right? How do we build this thing in a way that's solid, in a way that will evolve effectively, in a way that will scale, in a way that's feasible in the real world? How are we going to deal with you know, larger problems within this system, larger issues? How are we going to deal with many concurrent users? How are we going to deal with security vulnerabilities? So, you know, I think you're you're um other classes in many cases have 
given you problems where you build up skills to be able to undertake some tasks. And, and this class is some, some common tasks. And it you know tests your basic um, capacity to do this. This class is different. It's really, are you delivering value? And are you delivering sustained, robust, sound value in the real world uh, context, in, in the contemporary context? And that's hard. And you, some of you are aware here. The software industry is not in its eternal spring that has been talked about for decades, you know, where there's just this grand imbalance between demand and supply, where the, the jobs out there are plentiful and you know you're you can come out with basic basic knowledge from your classes and expect to get a job. It's changing. And technologies like Chat GPT. For all the, you know, the sort of overblown hype in some areas about it are really transforming software in some ways. And I'm not talking about using them to produce the code that goes directly into the code base, but I'm talking about strong programmers using them to increase their productivity, not by a factor of 50%, not by a factor of two, but by a factor of over 10. The estimates I've seen in some cases are 50, 30 to 50 times more productive by a programmer who knows what they're doing, knows how to use it for its strengths and knows how to deal with its weaknesses, uses it in a savvy way. A lot of the jobs where weaker software developers could be expected to thrive in the past will no longer be available because they'll be automated out of existence. And what's gonna get you a job and what's gonna lead to your career which flourishes is more than basic understanding. It's understanding of the substantive issues, not the pro forma ability to, you know, write a bit of code that that you know solves the FizzBuzz problem or something like that. And um, we are going into an era where there are big layoffs in tech. Some of you may be, you know, aware of it. Um, it's no longer a job guarantee, and the types of things you learn in this class are designed to give you that extra substance to make sure that you have what you need, that you're equipped to go out there and really thrive in a job and be able to, to show people that you know your stuff uh, when interviewing, but or in, in your internships or in uh, after you're being hired. So I want to talk today about one of those things nominally, but it's it's more than one Thing. It's really about a, a collection of things that are that are linked. And it has to do with um, a set of issues that are uh, uh, that are in common between a lot of your um, uh, your types of systems. Not all, not all your systems are the same. Uh, we're dealing with you know systems that might, might exist um, at a, at not not on the web, but in the context of uh, supporting a single user. Uh, we're dealing with systems that might be uh, desktop systems or that might be phone, you know, mobile uh, type systems. But a lot of these have common needs too, because um, they may have backend endpoints that um, uh, that uh, are, sh are shared with with other types of systems. So I want to I want to talk about these. I, I'm going to talk nominally about MTO architecture, but it's it's really about dealing in, in a way. This is a case study. Yes, it will apply for some of your projects. The projectile point. I, I want you to know this stuff. I want you to apply this stuff. I want to see this stuff in your system. Probably for a lot of the beep engine. I want to see it. We'll, we'll see, um, maybe for the veterinary services uh, system, maybe. Um, so I want to talk here, though, at a deeper level, about the ways in which needs in a certain domain or certain technical constraints combined with user needs lead to derived requirements that, that motivate certain architectures, okay? certain designs. And I want to see the designs that come out of your analysis of the needs of your area. So 
We've talked about user requirements and contrasted them in this class with derived requirements. What's a derived requirement compared to a user requirement? Can anyone say, anyone remind us? Uh, yes, uh, at the back and with my fuzzy, uh, I, I can't see her face. So um, let me see, is that is that Xander? No, okay, Cameron, okay. That's right. Yeah, so often we have basic user requirements, but the user requirements don't exist in isolation. In order to meet the user requirements with today's technology, today's environment, the fact that a web is not, the web is not a secure environment, the fact that we use connectionless protocols on the web, the fact that, you know, we can, we can't count on uh, always having a connection on a mobile device, right? Um, there are places in this province where there's no cell data service, et cetera. Um, et cetera, often these lead to, to derive requirements, sort of things that have to be in place for the, for the system to be success, success, not because the user requested them directly, but because the nature of the environment is such that to deliver on the user's requests, given today's constraints, these things are required. So I've, I've mentioned some of them up here, right? Um, and uh, these are central issues in a lot of uh, systems. Yes, uh, Daniel. Yes, um, these are really kind of lines about functional versus non-functional yes. Uh, it's somewhat, it's a good question, good question. A lot of these will be uh, non-functional requirements because they're not the sort of thing, normally the user won't be asked about non-functional requirements, right? They won't be asking often about um, things that have to do with uh, reliability or availability. Sometimes that's not true. Sometimes they, they do come into the request. Um, they may not be talking about extensibility of the system or or needs in terms of, of arch architecting it in a cross-platform basis. But um, there, there are times where this gets into functional requirements uh, as well um, that have to deal with how the system handles, for example, if you have a mobile app, um, how it handles being offline. Right. So maybe normally you submit photos through this app to your journal, and now suddenly you're offline. How does that affect the user interface? That would be something which does have a user side functional, you know, uh, manifestation. It, it 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 has some functional implications. Some something about the features that are and how the user interacts with them. But it's it's not it may not be in the user's mind when they request it. It's up to you to realize. Wait a minute, we have to deal with the fact that sometimes Wi-Fi is not available because the user might not remember that. Right? As as amazing as that is, um, and similarly for like the the veterinary veterinary application, the user may or may not be aware that often IT services will not install applications on your, you know, your uh, desktop app um, for uh, without a lot of hassle. So, you know, um, often derived requirements require a broader understanding of the state of today's technologies, what's possible. And often that is not what students understand. So for example, if I told you some of the requirements that come out of handling big data, Data science, you've heard the buzzwords, right? We're in the age of big data and so on. And there's there's a lot of truth to the fact that we are dealing with volumes of data that are massively larger, orders of magnitude larger than what we used to deal with. And it has massive impact on our architectures, our programming styles, the technologies used, the design requirements, and and a lot of it is because it is completely infeasible to, for example, load these data sets into main memory. It is completely infeasible to just take one and compute a function on it to get another one. 
we have to do it in a savvy pipeline way where it's only incrementally loaded into memory at any one time. And this requires different architectures. Uh, for example, use of functional programming techniques and use of laziness and incremental computation. But it also involves being able to deal with errors that come up in that process in a, in a functional way so it doesn't break the whole pipeline. And again, this drives choice of languages. It drives choice of architectures, et cetera. Um, so, you know, the architecture and design here has to reflect the constraints and the priorities. Um, and there's some mangled text at the bottom of that. So I've been mentioning data science. I mean, I, I do a lot of work in this area, but so do a lot of companies these days, right? Um, you're dealing with very, very large amounts of data. Maybe it's streaming data, maybe it's time series data, maybe it's cross-sectional data. Um, that you've got in, in databases. Maybe it's more structured, like you might store in a SQL database. Maybe it's less structured, like documents you might store in MongoDB, like Team 1 was considering, right? Um, or no, I'm sorry, that was Team N. Um, I can't remember. The, yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> the team for the uh, projectile point, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, here we have very large amounts of data, but we often have you know real limitations compared to those data sizes and memory and CPU um, speed. And and the opportunities for handling this data efficiently come from marshaling many computational resources, um, uh, rather than just making faster processes. When, when I say ma leveraging many computational resources to process data, what am I talking about? Using many what? That's kind of a very high level way of describing. What do I mean in concrete terms? What do I mean? Use many computational resources. What are we using to process that data faster? We're using, right. we're using different threads that make use of different cores often, right? Um, of, of a given processor, right? Um, so, you know, some of our machines over in our lab have 48 cores or whatever that we're, uh, we're leveraging. But we're also using many machines often, right? To process the data, breaking up the work across them. We also have to handle exceptional situations because you get divided by zero in part of the data set or whatever, or you might have certain machines fail. You know, like Google running large labs of machines, these giant you know, server farms, whether it's for deep learning or, or other purposes, like machine failure is not, something they handle in an ad hoc reactive way. They have to count on it. You know, you, you have to count on the fact that machines are gonna fail each and every day. There's gonna be machine failures and you need a streamlined process for handling those machine failures such that it won't break the system, right? Um, so you gotta be able to, whether it's a pipeline for data processing or large scale computation across machines, be able to handle, be robustly able, resiliently able to handle these failures. Um, and uh, you need to be able to, to handle the diversity of different needs, like with data science, some interactive use for exploratory data analysis, and some production use where you're running some things over and over again. And it turns out that this leads to a whole set of needs, right? You use... Um, uh, functional programming languages that allow for very nice pipelines that are clear dependencies. You can understand what depends on what and parallelize the heck out of them. Um, you can use monads to handle exceptional situations in, in your in program in a way that keeps the integrity of the pipeline instead of have throwing an exception that knocks you out of the pipeline. Um, you can handle missing values and failures. You can handle future values that aren't computed yet in asynchronous computation in a very nice way. Um, and uh, you can support you know, um, this from the very flexible stage to production stage with a set of, of basic API characteristics um, and architectural characteristics. But I want to talk today some about three-tier web architecture um, as well, or N-tier in general. Um, because it seemed like you folks were kind of exposed to some of these ideas, but maybe not much more than a superficial level, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, the memories are fading. So um, there's, there's a set of needs that come up with web architectures that reflect um, traffic characteristics of, of contemporary web use. 
Um, so when we're dealing with the web, um, there's a set of facts of life we have to deal with. What are some characteristics of the web context in terms of traffic? Can anyone say? What are some traffic characteristics about the web? Yes. The amount of people who are kind of trying to enter the website or like use a specific spot of it, like yeah. they are trying to view or do a specific. Okay, thing. yeah. So there may be groups of people that are are those people coming at all times during the day equally or they, um so I take Matthew back there too. Oh, no, but also if your web traffic is routed between multiple people that could observe what the traffic is. Uh, that's right. That's that's exactly right. Um, so there um, there can be a diversity a diversity of types of of use of it. But um, not sure I fully got Matthew's point there. But uh, Artelon, were you going to say something further? Yeah. So I, I what in addition to what Matthew said, I wanted to say like they can come in any hours or they can invite them on actually in specific hours. For example, they are going to use that specific functionality. That's right. It from eleven a.m. to that's right. PM. That's right. So, it's going to yep. find yeah, and there could be different needs for different components, different types of users, right? Uh, uh, administrative users, different people using different functionality on there. What else? So we talked sort of bursty, Juan. Yeah. What about security? Exactly. The, the web is not a nice place. You know, um, it's a very eye-opening experience if you've ever put up a website and you look at the logs. Like there will be people trying to break into it. Sometimes it's script kiddies that are running scripts, you know, trying to trying to find machines they can break into and turn into bots, right? Um, uh, sometimes it's it's hackers that are more determined and and smell a financial reward or you know ransomware reward and go after it. It's a rough neighborhood out there, online, and it will come to you. <laughs> Anything that's on the web will will be visited by these folks, often nightly. If you look at the logs, it's 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 rather sobering to see. What other characteristics are there of sort of web traffic? Yes, uh, a name. Uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. A uh, so response time is a key need, right? Um, you can get timeouts if you're not responsive. The latency until someone sees a sees a response is key, right? But also of interest beyond. Satisfying people's requests quickly is what? A need, an interest in what? Yes. Reliability, Reliability is, is, is extremely important. Yeah. Um, have, uh, have your machine have very, very little and by way of failure, right? You may have heard of, you know, um, uh, you know, four nines or six nines, right? 99.999% uptime for availability as well. Um, so all of those are are important, but but drawing on Jeffrey's comments, um, we have latency, but we have another type of need too. What is it, Matthew? Yeah, race conditions between users are going to be a play a big role in in uh, some of what I comment on on the vulnerabilities or the the things we have to be mature to to handle. Um, but I was I was thinking, you know, throughput. What what is throughput compared to latency? Anyone? What does what does throughput have to deal with? Yes. Uh, throughput uh, kind of depends on what website trying to throughput. Like is it the data? Yeah. It has to be able to kind of process the storage, or maybe add yeah. access. To the yeah. So something like Beep Engine, yeah. for example, may have there there may be some need for quick response, right? Um, for a given query, but there may be a need to handle different requests. Um, uh. In, you know, uh, per day at a very high level. So, so that's what throughput is. You know, how many requests can you handle per deliver on per day, right? Um, can you can you successfully address? So, right, you've got you've got all these characteristics, and you know, um, this is one of the tough lessons. You know, we in software we we build systems that we we dream often of of um. Getting, getting attention to our, our shiny new web app, our front end for our startup, so we can showcase our services or wares on um, these products we've rolled out, whatever it is. We, we dream of that. And it's a, it's a harsh truth about life that often 
when people rush to our website, maybe they've seen a blog post about it, maybe they've seen a, a TikTok video which advertises it, and they 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 chase it down. Maybe they've seen a YouTube promotion that 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 gets them there, and people rush there. That's the time you're most vulnerable. Why do I say that? Tons of people are hitting your website. Why do I say? I mean, it's the time to shine, right? But why is why are you vulnerable? Um, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 gosh, um, is it something like Melvin or <laughs> Glenn? Is it Glenn? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Not not Melvin. Okay. <laughs> what is I found in your website that is like you can um yeah to get uh. Be on COVID live, so yes. Um, therefore, there are an of my attitudes for Yeah, well, well, yeah. So, so we can sharpen that. But you're exactly right. That look, this is a time where because of the traffic, your website is under more. We saw it in some of the applic some of the slides, right? Stress. Remember, someone yeah. said stress testing, right? Yeah. You want to test that it functions well under stress, and and it's a, again, it's a painful fact. But often we test our system not under stress. We test with small numbers of users, small number of requests at a time, et cetera. And it functions great. But then when it's large numbers of users, large numbers of requests, when we most need it, because people are actually interested in it, right? They're flocking to us. They're trying it out. Maybe it's our first deployment. Maybe it's our first big customer. It'll fail. Why? Why does it fail? What's what's vulnerable about it? Yes, Arlon. The vulnerable thing is that the entire thing we're designed to take. I mean, according to what's taken in their world, what the yes. as possible to recognize the use. You're trying to kind of be like, well, to make a prediction, as you said, software engineers are not the best to make a prediction. So uh, we might have made a wrong prediction of long people that maximum them to use this and this will not also uh, okay, okay. So so that can be true. You know, we underestimated. So we want to be able to handle larger scalability maybe than we we estimated we need. But I would argue that even if it's within the bounds of what you anticipated. Things become vulnerable at large amounts of use. Why? Why? Why does your website often, you know, fail to work? Then, even though it works under low load. Yes, Abby. Okay. Yeah. So perhaps you don't have effective load balancing. So the system starts timing out because it's got it's putting all sorts of load in certain backend servers or certain parts of the system that become bottlenecks. So that could absolutely be the case. And what else starts to happen uh, in these contexts? Yes, uh, 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 Lee. E. e. Yes. E. And uh, I think the, the great uh, uh, vulnerability, and also we can leak some uh, information. If you don't have the protection of the server, you could leak some information to my uh, If you don't have protection of a yeah, that's right. That's right. The user may be able to see some that's sort of fantastic. inconsistent state, especially if it's not able to handle concurrency well, as, as, as we'll see. Yes, uh, Arnold. So the nature of the network is that it's like a traffic like a, a normal life in cars. So yeah. when you're in the train, like when there's traffic, you, are, you can see individual cars. So in that case, when the traffic is also compared to the website, you might be able to extract the data as well because like, the system is trying to wait for getting the data. Again. That's right. The system is undergoing large delays in getting data and fulfilling requests. So one user's request is running for a long time. And if you don't build it with a, a sound architecture, a sound architecture, a correct architecture, that it's sound, that it is robust, correct. It's not It's not a, you know, oh, it's just not good enough. No, no, no. Did you build in soundly the ability to handle concurrency? If you're not soundly handing concurrency, you will be dead in the water when you start getting large numbers of users because each user will be there for a while 
that there needs um, dealt with because the database is really, really busy. The front end is really, or the, the servers for the middleware are really, really busy. For the business logic, maybe. And, and you're going to start to have non transactional property seen. And you will have users seeing partly computed results of, uh, of other transactions. And you cannot. You cannot handle that in a robust fashion. The way to handle that robustly is through transactions. And I, when I ask people how many people have seen transactions, understand transactions, there are very few people here who've seen that. So we have to talk about transactions. It's a fact of life. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't manage transactions. You're going to be leaving yourself open um, in in a web context with large amounts of concurrency needs. You're going to be leaving yourselves open to complete system failure, um, and it'll be very hard to debug because it's based on chance events of who's hitting it at what time and what inconsistent state. So common web needs here is high availability, right? Um, uh, you wanna you wanna maintain the asset properties. When I say asset properties, what am I talking about? Look at Robin. He's like database 101 for concurrency. Yes. Um, Ming? Sorry. Right. Good. Yeah. Um, that's right. So, atomicity, things are atomic. What do I mean by atomic? One duck and cover. What what do I mean by atomic? Uh thoughts. I'm not sure that you're not too close to the most part. Atomic means when I have that it can um have a request, I gotta get it done or it doesn't get done. There's no option in between. Yeah, so so atomicity means um it's it's as if the thing is either not yet been started or it's completed. You're not seeing it halfway through. Right. Um, consistency has to do with a, a, a similar thing. You're not seeing you're not seeing things in a halfway inconsistent state where the the operation has only been partly partly performed. Independent, you've got different transactions and they don't they don't entangle in some ugly way where each has to be concerned with the state of the other. They're independent of one another. Each one succeeds or not. Um, and if durable things stick, if it crashes, um, if it crashes after a transaction, there's mechanisms to ensure that that's logged out through a log structured file system or what have you, and that that will be recovered in its guaranteed uh, transacted state. It's state that that um, that, that thing. Uh, and um, Along with this is the need to handle errors. So if errors occur in the, in the atomic transaction, what happens? What happens if this transaction is trying to write to this database, read from that database, write this to disk, um, uh, check this other thing in this database? And one of those databases, so it's, it's most of the way through, it's almost done, and then a database fails and it, it, it can't write that information. What happens? Yes, Ardalan. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's that's true. It will fail and it has to do what? In order to fail consistently, what has to happen? Yes, Matthew. And they have to roll back. Do people know what I mean by rollback? What do I, okay, what do I mean? So Bob's. I go back to the state it was in before, before you started the transaction. Now, this is this is really important. Um, that you know, either it and again, it has to do with this notion of, as Bob said before, it's either like you haven't yet started, or you've entirely finished. If you if you have problems partway through, you crash partway through, or you can't get the information partway through. You're not going to be able to complete the transaction. You don't just say, well, couldn't complete it. And, you know, guess what? We'll, we'll, we'll just punt. Um, you can't say that. You have to be mature. You have to say, roll it back. 
to the original state, even if you've written to other databases, right? Even if you've performed operations elsewhere, even if you've updated files, you have to be able to roll them all back as if you never started. Do you understand the implications of that? The significance of that? That has to do with handling failure maturely. And it's an essential thing when we have large numbers of users um, interacting with the system. It's, it's an essential thing for guaranteeing the systems in sane states. Because if it dies partway through, it could be in all sorts of inconsistent states, right? You've, you've committed to shipping the book, but you never got the user's payment. And now you're gonna have to ship the book to them, even though you don't didn't get the payment from them. You don't want that, right? You, you either wanna have the money from the user and ship the product, or you, if you can't if you can't do that, if you can't complete that transaction, you want to not charge them and not ship the product. Do you understand that? You don't want to die halfway through when you charge them and you don't ship. Or you don't want to say, I'll ship it and not charge them. You want both or neither. Do you understand that notion of a transaction? Okay. Um, you want it? You, you, you're going to be concerned, as Jeffrey said, about performance, right? Guaranteeing a certain amount of throughput, a certain amount of... Of, of, of lower latency, hopefully. You want scalability. I want to be able to ramp up to higher levels of handling, handling more transactions per day, handling more users per day, delivering on needs by putting in more money. And I might scale over, you know, scale horizontally or scale vertically, um, throw more machines at it, for example, or throw machines that are bigger at more cores. But I want to be able to invest in, in my infrastructure, say my hardware, putting in place multiple database backends, or putting in place multiple web servers and have it scale uh, effectively. Daniel. Uh, sorry, atomicity? Transactional acid. Oh, so, so. When we talk about something being transactional in this context, when we use that word that it's transactional, we're saying that it observes the acid properties. Okay. Um, so it's atomic. It's either as if it has never occurred or it's totally finished. You never see it sort of partway through. It's consistent because of that. We're not. We're not seeing it where, you know, we agreed to take the money. We, we, we've taken the money, but we haven't um, shipped the product, for example. Um, things are independent of one another. So we have multiple transactions and one doesn't depend on the partway state of the other. And it's durable. So if you commit to a transaction, if you commit, by God, we're shipping that book, we've taken their money. Even if your server crashes after that, you'll be able to recover that fact and, and guarantee it. Um, if there's a danger that you won't be able to do that, you have to be able to roll back and cancel the whole thing. If you can't commit to sticking through with this transaction because of a hardware failure, you haven't yet committed the transaction. That's why we have two phase commit protocols, right? We, we, we say, hey, we're ready to commit. And then we actually fully commit. And if there's some failure in the way between those, then the transaction fails and we'll we'll roll it back. Um, we have to be able to ensure security here. Um, and there's a whole set of technology needs for different types of attacks, um, including sanitizing strings that might hold, you know, elements of uh, SQL injection um, uh, attacks, etc. Um, and a lot of this, this this notion of of handling things transactionally to deal with effective management of concurrency. What do I mean by concurrency? When I, when I say concurrency, what do I mean? Hmm? Hmm? Um, I'm going to go to Tony back there. Yeah, so we have many users, for example, interacting with our system at once, or maybe it's a web service we're running. And we have memory, many types of requests occurring at once, right, Daniel? Yeah. When, 
Does this sheet look fancy when we're working on the same data? Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. They need to um, not write while the other one is. Uh, That's right. So, for example, there are locking protocols. Um, if if I if I talk about database locking, how many how many people are feel um, you know quite comfortable with with you know very very confident about that term, database locking? Okay, yeah. So so what Daniel's referring to is um, is the fact to guarantee the asset properties atomic, consistent, independent, durable. We have to have some sort of mechanisms of ensuring. That while I'm working on some piece of the data, you're not stomping on it, right? You're not changing it out from under me because I'm counting on its value being something. Maybe it's the primary key I just inserted to the database. And just because you're in a rates condition with me, as Matthew said, we don't want to assign the same, you know, primary key to them, or or we don't want me to say, yes, so I'm going to ship you this product. It's the last one in stock. I'm taking your money. And meanwhile, someone else just at the same time has come and they bought the same product. And we've committed to shipping both to both of them when there's only one product. So we have to be able to lock for the duration of the, of the transaction while I'm verifying that your money is being paid to me. I lock, no one else can take this product that I'm committing to shipping. So when I charge them for the purchase, they're guaranteed to get the book. Right or guaranteed to get the product, whatever it is, um, and and if something fails along that way, I roll it back. I don't take their money, and they don't get the product. But I can't have someone else grab that product out from underneath it after I've you know committed to them um, by taking their money. Um, it's it's really we we need to be able to use locking to prevent users from stomping on each other halfway through. Uh, another common web need is to be able to separate things with different uh, data, with different technologies associated with them, like the data storage, the UI layer, um, to be able to adapt um, uh, over time to uh, changes in user volumes. Fault tolerance. What do I mean by fault tolerance? I'm, I mentioned it earlier, but what do I mean? What's, what's this notion of fault tolerance? Anyone? Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, if you were to talk to the wallet, Good, good. So absolutely right for for users. Uh, if if maybe they refresh the web page twice, or they press submit twice, right? Or or they maybe they they fail to enter something. But it can also mean fault tolerance for other ugly facts of life. Like sometimes um, this can crash, right? Sometimes web connections go down, right? Sometimes the connection to a web service your system is using is down. And we have to be able to, we have to be mature and we have to be responsible and able to handle this fault in a fault tolerant way. And that means failing gracefully, but it can also mean, I'll be with you in a second, Ardalan, it can also mean failing over, like if a disk crashes on one database server, we have other servers that are up that will handle that or other disks that are redundant. I, you folks heard of RAID, RAID systems? Yeah. You know RAID systems? Yeah. Where did you encounter those? Uh, 215 and 232. Okay, yeah, 215 and 332. So redundant array of inexpensive disks, right? The idea is um, you, have, you have these sets of disks and you get many benefits out of it, right? The ability to read out very quickly from, from many of them. So you get some performance advantages from, from say, streaming reading from, from several of them at once rather than waiting for the platen to spin around or with SSD, it's a different technology. But, but, but here's the thing. Also, it gives you fault tolerance because if one of those disks fails, you can still read from the others, right? They're guaranteed to have overlapping contents, right? And so any one piece of content is duplicated on several disks, right? Remember that from Raid? A um, little bit? Yes, uh, Ardalan. Uh, what also two factors is that, for example, if some uh, in our system can also be flexible enough so that if you have error happen, you can recover in some time without kind of the user being able to kind of see that. 
Yeah, I mean, it can occur to operating systems, but oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so web browsing uh, um, handles it correctly and, um, you know, is, is robust in that context. So what I'm saying is in a web context, you typically want to, you, it, it can be very advantageous to build fault tolerant systems. And again, this is part of being mature. It's recognizing failures will happen and we need to be able to respond to them in a mature way, in a responsible way, in a way that, you know, handles many types of failure gracefully. Um, sometimes that means just, you know, um, leaving the system in a consistent state, transactional, that's a great start, but often it will mean failing over to Excuse me. Um, uh, <clears throat> a failure in the database server side, um, or being able to handle a failure on the web server by having, you know, duplicate uh, uh, systems that can handle that uh, failover in terms of the uh, the disks that are provided. Um, beyond this, uh, we we will often want to handle multiple types of front ends. What do I mean by this? In the context of today's systems. Why do I say, like, when we have a, a server-side architecture, we we'll often want to be able to handle multiple types of front-ends. What sort of front-end might I be talking about? Yes, Bob's. Um, like, you have to have on different devices. Exactly. So maybe you have a web-based access to it, but you also have mobile access to it, right? And this, you don't want to have to have a completely different system serving each of those on the back end. You want common endpoints that are used by both systems. So regardless of whether I access it from my tablet, from my phone, via a website or a desktop app, all of those play together nicely, right? And what I see in one is consistent with what I see in another. You have to architect that in, right? We, we, we don't have a whole architecture on the web just for our phones and another totally different one for our tablets and another totally different one for web-based access. They all have to, all have to um, play, uh, play nicely. So a key need here that I've been emphasizing is, is um, handling concurrency safely. Look, the, the reality is if you're successful, and I help all of you, you're tremendously successful. Um, you're going to hopefully be dealing with many users at once. People who are interested, whatever service, products, uh, um, you know, value you're delivering. So you have many users coming to your system simultaneously, concurrently, at the same time, and you know these users will be doing things that are often undertaking transactions that may involve multiple accesses to different databases and services and rights to deliver on their needs. And if you're not handling them transactionally, if you're just saying, okay, do this now, do that, do that and that, and there's no transactional envelope under which these things are occurring, you're going to get interference by different users. You're going to see one user see halfway through another user's operation. So, so they're going to be, um, you know, one person coming to buy this product will uh, will start to pay for it, and the payment um, uh, has been taken. Um, but when they go to get it, another one will have grabbed it out from underneath them, and we um, will will have this interference which could lead to us failing to be um, uh, to, to deliver through uh, for that customer. We need ways of handling things transactionally so that we are um, upstanding in how we how we deal with users. Um, uh, so we don't want you know different users to interfere with each other halfway through their operations and to leave the system in an inconsistent state because they can't complete it. And the key for this is transaction. Um, but I want to talk some more about some other anti-patterns besides not using transaction. <clears throat> One of them that I fear 
for your cause. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. Oh, man. Um, I, uh, I've, I've seen some projects in this class that have had front ends, like web servers directly talking to the UV, to the database. So the front end, this is you quite a lot of interfaces and um, uh, so they're mixing UI and business logic together. The, when I say business logic, I mean they're they have um reasoning in the UI that's actually about domain logic. Um, but they're going directly to the database. So it's all mixed together in this unholy hairball. It's really I can't imagine what a holy hairball is, but um, but it's certainly an you know, unholy hairball, I'll tell you that. Um, and uh, and it turns out this is a total anti-pattern. When when the web was first, when, when the web was young, um, <laughs> when the web was young, um, I learned to shave on a riding tongue. Um, no, uh, when, when when the uh, when the web was young, there were actually quite a few um, websites, web early web apps that tried to use this architecture. It's total non-starter. We'll talk about why next time. Um, uh, maintaining high numbers of objects persistently in middleware um, uh, on a persistent level between different requests by the same user uh, will not scale effectively when we have when we don't know whether that user is going to return. And 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 if you go to the database too many times, many small scale. A database operations, you know, getting this little bit of data, that little bit of data, that little bit of data, you're not gonna be able to scale with that. Um for if you've got big data sets. Um uh long holds of locks, you've got to really watch out on. Um so holding locks on a database, preventing someone else from accessing it. You want to make sure your transactions are not locking it. Um, in a deadlock fashion, but even for, for persistent times, so it's a real challenge when there's high demand uh, for your system. Um, many, many requests to open and close database connections are that's very expensive and it can really slow your system down and cause uh, exhaustion of the number of database connections uh, that are available. Um, and locking clients to particular servers is sort of sticky locking and, and it can prevent uh, fault tolerance. So these are some um, uh, some uh, some anti patterns that come up in this context. And next time, I want to talk some, having given this motivation, about concurrency management. Okay. Um, and in this case, um, we're going to be using transactioning um, to. Provide these guarantees, atomic consistent infinite for all, um, uh, to provide a performance um, meeting of of the needs um, of of many users. Uh, hopefully, by using effective scaling and uh, and parallel um, parallel handling, while guaranteeing soundness that we're not we're not uh, violating the basic uh, things that need to be consistent, the basic properties. Um, and here, transaction will be used to roll back the state if failure occurs. The web, the, the internet context, the dependence of one machine on another, on, of your system on other services, other um, on, on servers and, and database, uh, database servers or, or business logic servers, these things uh, can break. And if you have failure, you need to be able to roll back this eight. And that's what transactions guarantee. Um, and transactions are isolated from one another um, so that they, uh, you know, it's, it's, they don't look inside each other. It's, it's like each of them is operating uh, atomically and it's like one goes before the other or after the other. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how transactioning uh, can help provide these guarantees. Um, in web apps, transactions give these concurrency guarantees that we need to be correct. Never mind, you know, just perform it, but correct when we have large numbers of users. So we won't crack. 
which is an important thing to, for satisfied users. Um, and the basic scope here are users' actions on a single page. Um, and we need to build in build in mechanisms for ensuring transactionality. Fortunately, modern database systems that are geared for multi-user use, things like uh, Postgres or Firebase, um, Supabase, which is kind of an open source Firebase alternative, um, uh, Oracle, et cetera, these have really sophisticated transactioning support. Um, in this class, if you're wondering, like, how does this apply to my project? These things, I think, are going to apply to quite a few of the projects. Loading in new data, uploading a data set, analysis of, of existing data set, uh, displaying data for a user. Um, um, one project not adopted was assigning videos for patients or, or updating data on a projectile point connection. What you don't want is things like you're uploading a data set, failure occurs, and it's only halfway uploaded. Can you see why that would be a problem? Because if it's only halfway uploaded, the database may not be in a consistent state. It's done some things, but not others. Some tables have been correctly updated, others have not, right? You, you see that? So if it dies halfway through, you need to be able to say, roll back. It's as if we never did, right? Or if the database crashes and you bring it up again, it's as if it was never started. This is, this is the power of today's database systems and transactional systems built on top of them, that they allow this robust guarantee. But this guarantee is not guaranteed if you're building it from scratch without tapping these database, with these, with these transaction features of databases. You need them. Um, same thing with loading new data into something like the Veep engine or something. Um, you, you need to be able to handle things in this robust way. And here's the thing. Users, even fairly savvy users, say Dr. Bullock on the on the Veep engine stuff, right? Um, um, they're often not going to know about these, these constraints. They may be quite you know, heavy computational users, but they've never had a class and database systems, don't know about transactionality, don't know about atomicity, don't understand why to be correct and large when you have different users simultaneously, you need to make these guarantees. Same thing with projectile points. You know, someone who's in a different area of computer science, let's say um, data science, or let's say, um, you know, dealing with, uh, uh, you know, image recognition or what have you, they may not be trained to this sort of stuff. This is stuff that comes up with software engineering, software development needs and, and computer systems needs. And so projectile points, that may be, you know, the project may be sponsored by a stakeholder, maybe in computer science, but that doesn't mean they'll think to request it. They may either think you know it or they're not aware that you need to know. It. But you do because it, it won't it won't be a start. You know, uh, it like the system will not work for serious numbers of users without this. And if you tell me, well, it really doesn't need to, I'm sorry, I won't accept that. It needs to be able to handle it. Okay. Um, so here, um, I expect your systems to be mature in dealing with the realities of these issues. Because when you go into industry, you will need to deal with the reality of the issues or your business will go out of, you know, it will go bust. It will, it will not succeed as a business. Um, so we're going to be talking next time about layered architectures that, that help this. I think many of you have seen this before, the basic idea, at least on paper, right, pro forma. You have some sort of database layer, persistence layer down here, right? You have some business logic up here, right? Some service layer. It goes by by different names, um, but uh, but handles sort of the, the key domain logic. And you'll have a presentation layer and sometimes layers in between, which route you to different endpoints, et cetera. These sorts of layered architectures give us many benefits and provide a framework for delivering on a lot of these needs for that, that confront us in the web, but in other cases. And so we're gonna be talking about these 
separation of concerns here and the responsibilities of these different layers and how they interact with transactionality of the database layer by, by spawning transactions from above. So that's, uh, we're gonna expand on this next time, but I wanna give you a, um, a final word. Some of you may be sitting there. So I'm not... You know, what does this have to do with the Ocular Pro? No, I'm not convinced that it has something to do with the veterinary uh, veterinary clinic update. Um, because it, maybe it's not designed to be a high availability web application. My point here is you've got to recognize whatever domain you're in, there's going to be key needs there that often the user will not articulate, but you have to attend to, or you're not going to build a successful system. They're not things the user will describe as criteria for success, but they are things that if you don't deliver on them, the project will not succeed. And for the Oculus, you know, I don't want to get seasick when I'm looking at these data sets. And believe me, there's a long known history of Oculus getting people seasick, uh, seasick when there's not uh, when there's not appropriate um, uh, performance within. Um, uh, you need to be able to identify the technical challenges in your domain. You need to be able to have different elements of your architecture that will separate interface from implementation. I'm not hearing a lot about this right now in the presentation. I hope I see them in ID1. If I don't, I sure as heck want to see them in ID2. Interfaces between different areas of the system, you know, separation of interface and implementation. Um, if concurrency is a big issue for you, um, it's not a big issue, for example, for the Oculus project. It's a, I view it as a big issue for the projectile point, for sure. I view it as beat uh, engine, probably a, a big issue. And quite possibly for the veterinary, certain sides of the veterinary clinic um, issues. Um, you want to avoid directly calling across layers. You want to have a, a nice uh, uh, architected division of, of separation of concerns and logic. Um, and I'm going to want, for those who have business logic layers, like for those multi-tier systems, that you have solid representation of, of the domain entities in there to manipulate them abstractly, not just going to the database writing code that directly hits the database, reads things in, and performs calculations. No, I want to see some sort of abstractions that allow you to manipulate this data, perform operations on it. Um, maybe it's perform principal components analysis. Maybe it's normalize it or standardize it. Maybe it's you know perform a, a embedding on it. Whatever. Um, and uh, you're going to be wanting to think if you're using databases, and most of you will be, about batching things together so you can do a lot with a single query of the database. Draw a lot of data out instead of saying, "Give me this little bit of information, that little bit, that little bit in separate requests." SQL queries. Okay, so, so start to think, where are the pain points here? Where are the areas we have to take maturely or this will not succeed? And I want to see documentation that you've done that. And I want to see the interfaces that will specify different, you know, serve as kind of the gateways to different areas of your system. I want to see those APIs fleshed out in your design plan. Okay, so maybe you have that for ID1 and I'll be a happy camper if you haven't. I want it for ID2 as a central part of the deliverable. What is your design plan? What's your architecture design plan? What are the software interfaces that you're writing? You've done it before in class. I want to see it for your systems. Okay. Okay. That's all for today. We'll continue on on Tuesday. Thank you.